True and Falsely Jesus in the Bible Part 5 Deconstructing this fake image of Jesus 3. Was Jesus a curse? And does the law of God bring curses upon men? This is precisely what the falsifier had suggested and, in doing so, he betrayed the teaching of Jesus. His own warped philosophy was thus, as Jesus was hanged upon a tree, he must have been cursed because the scripture says, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, Deuteronomy 21 23. What the scripture actually says is this, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and he was hung on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but it should be buried that day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Deuteronomy 21 22-23. What if an innocent man was unjustly hanged to death on tree, would he be cursed? Surely not. So the scripture talks about the criminal who was sentenced to death. It has nothing to do with what this falsifier is trying to impute to Jesus when he manipulated the scripture out of context to fit his false claim of an accursed Jesus and the curse of the law. So if Jesus was hanged on a tree, as this inventor believed, was he hanged as a cursed criminal? This falsifier exploited the rumor that was spread by the Jews that they had killed Jesus then was resurrected. He has put more focus on the alleged death and resurrection of Jesus and manufactured a paganized teaching for Christianity. One where the gift of salvation can be fast-tracked by faith alone, without any behavioral requirement or legal obligation. For this forger claimed that the law of God, which he gave to man as a pattern of worship, was introduced in order to increase wrongdoing. To the extent that it would bring a curse to those who act depend on it. This is not true. The law of God was not introduced to increase wrongdoing, but to establish the system of worshipping God through faith and deeds. God had created humanity different from angels. The human being is by nature subject to erring. But the best of those who commit sins are those who repent because they realize their mistake and grieve of over them. They turn to God in order that he may forgive them, for God is the most forgiving, most gracious, most merciful. It is not befitting God to have a son and to sacrifice him in order to wash away the sins of man with his blood, as the pagan gods did. But it was this falsifier who formed his own particular teaching, up a step from blood of a bull as in Mithraism to the blood of the Son of God according in his own pagan doctrines. He falsely claimed, God delivered his son to redeem those who were under the law. Because a person is put right with God only through faith in Jesus, who loved us and gave his life for us, never by doing what the law requires. For if a person is put right with God through the law, it means that Jesus died for nothing Jesus became a curse for us. He has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings to those who depend on obeying the law. This falsifier opposed God, the one gave the law. He opposed Jesus, the one who had said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one title by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17-18 And he also opposed the disciple, James the brother of Jesus, who said, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And by works faith was made perfect. You see then that a man is put right with God by works, and not by faith alone. James 2 20, 22, 24 4. This falsifier fraudulently claimed that all of mankind were God's enemies. That newborn babies were born sinners as a result of the disobedience of Adam. Because of this, the innocent baby is born contaminated by that sin. Then, only some 2,000 years ago, God found a solution to stop this enmity between him and mankind and made us his friends by sacrificing his own son. So, as a result of Jesus' obedience, we were put right with God, who made all mankind his friends through Jesus, regardless of their sins. This falsifier was the first one to introduce the concept of original sin and the inheritance of that sin of Adam. These concepts raise many questions, such as when God created man, did he know that man would commit sins due to the free will that he already granted him? If the answer is yes, that he indeed knew that Adam would sin, because he did not create Adam as an angel, then what, during all those thousands of years between Adam and the time of Jesus, was the solution to the problem of the alleged inherited sin? Was God, all those years, trying to convince his alleged son to sacrifice himself to cover up this expected sin? But then, in the end, God felt compelled not to show compassion for his own alleged son as the forger claimed. Is not God always all-pardoning, all-forgiving, the most gracious and the most merciful? Cannot God forgive a sin without harming anyone? In what state did that forger hold the millions of people before Jesus all over the world who never heard about the alleged Savior and never believed in his mythology? 
or God, glory to him, did not know that Adam would sin, so he tried to cover up this human defect with the blood of his alleged son. Glory be to God. He is free from all that this forger has ascribed to him. Many other questions remain. Such as why are you, the dear reader, and everyone else for that matter, in any way responsible for the sin of Adam? How can one be considered guilty for something they knew nothing of and were not involved in? And how a person is put right with God, through a sacrifice that issued from another person, millions of people did not feel it, and did not interact with it psychologically and practically. In any civilized law, people are not supposed to be punished for something they have no control over. So, is man more just than God who allows the inheritance of the alleged original sin? If Satan already succeeded to mislead many people during previous centuries through pagan creeds, how is it that the people of this later century who are more literate and educated find it acceptable to inherit and believe in such heresies and mythology that underrate the might of the true God? Nowhere in the words of God can we find such a concept of an inherited original sin. The sin of Adam and Eve was forgiven immediately as soon as they both realized their mistake and immediately repented. God was in no need to wait until the time of Jesus to forgive the sin of Adam. And there was no need for blood to forgive such sin, since he is the most forgiving. He never inspired any of his messengers, Jesus included, as regards any notion of an original sin. Even the words of Jesus himself never spilled out such a creed. The teaching of God as regards sins has always remained consistent everyone is responsible for his own sin. There is no inheritance in sins between father and son, mother and daughter. In Ezekiel 18.20, we read, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. And Jeremiah 31 colon 30 similarly reads, But every one shall die for his own sin. 5. This falsifier plotted against Jesus to destroy his teaching. In fact, there are not texts he wrote that give the actual teaching of Jesus. Instead, he plotted to spread his own philosophy and his own brand of pagan Christianity in the Gentile world. God too plotted to expose the lies and deceptions of this falsifier through his own writings in order that anyone seeking the truth could notice his fussed and deceptions. This falsifier taught that the whole function of Jesus is centered on his alleged death and resurrection. He said, and if Jesus has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. And we are shown to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised Jesus from death whom he did not raise. Thus, he placed all his eggs in one basket. Gambling with his credibility by making his own version of Christianity totally dependent upon faith in the alleged crucifixion. If Jesus has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. So, it is easy for anyone who really has the intention in his heart to seek the truth to shortcut to it. If it can proven that Jesus was rescued by God, then the falsifier's forgery and false witness is exposed. More details about the crucifixion will follow within the coming subjects. Here are some verses that clearly state that Jesus used to avoid the plot of his Jewish enemies to kill him. With a surety that God in the end would rescue him he even prophesied to both the Jews and his disciples about God's rescuing him and that it would occur in two phases as follows. In John 7 colon 32 34 when the Pharisees and the chief priests sent some guards to arrest Jesus, he said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer and then I go away to him who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me because you cannot go where I will be. So, when was the prophecy of looking for Jesus by the Jews fulfilled? Was it while he on earth, or while he was in heaven? Surely it was while he on earth. They never looked for him after the event of the crucifixion. In fact, there is a verse indicates that Jesus had already told his disciples that the world, the Jews, would not see him upon his appearance from hiding. And the ban would continue till he ascend to heaven. He said to his disciples, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer and the world, the Jews, will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also, John 14, 18-19. If Jesus' prophecy when he said to the Jews, you will look for me, means while he on earth, so did the Jews find him or not? If one believes that the Jews already found and killed him, then one must also believe that Jesus was talking nonsense and his prophecy when he said to the Jews, but you will not find me. Because you cannot go where I will be was false. But if one believes that Jesus was telling the truth about the prophecy of looking for him, while he was on earth, and they would not find him, then that person must also believe that Jesus was not found and was not killed, but that God rescued him. One cannot have it both ways. Then Jesus confirmed the previous prophecy in John 7:34 to his disciples at the Last Supper, after Judas had left. 
He said, My children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will look for me, but I tell you now what I told the Jews, you cannot go where I am going. John 13 33. In this prophecy there are three considerations. One Jesus would go somewhere alone, shortly after the Last Supper. Two, the disciples would look for Jesus after he had disappeared from them. Three, neither the Jews nor the disciples can go to the place where Jesus was hiding. So, when Jesus had challenged the Jews and said to them, You cannot go where I will, John 7 34. And when he also said to them, Where I go you cannot come. John B 8 21. Also, when he said to his disciples, You cannot go where I am going, John 13 33, he did not mean by the place where he was going, heaven. Because, the Jews looked for him before the event of the crucifixion while he was still on earth, and after the event, Jesus suddenly appeared to his disciples only. No Jew ever looked for Jesus during his appearance period till he ascended to heaven, and this means that the place of refuge was on earth. The same thing with the disciples, when Jesus prophesied and said to them, My children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will look for me, this prophecy of looking for him by the disciples had to be fulfilled, and they would look for him while he was still on earth. They never looked for him after his ascension. And why should they look for him while they know that he was in heaven? Because they were present at his ascension. Luke 24 50-51 But heaven would be the second phase of rescuing Jesus. In the first phase, Jesus would go somewhere for a while, no one would see him. He already challenged both the Jews and the disciples and said to them, You cannot go where I am going, John 13:33. Then after the event of the crucifixion, he would walk out of that place, ready to go to the second phase, the ascension to heaven. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. John 14 18 So, the disciples would see him. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. John 14 19 But the Jews will see him no more. A little while longer in the world, the Jews will see me no more. John 14 19. This meaning is supported with another text in John where Jesus said to his disciples, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. Because I go to the Father. John 16 16. In this text, there are three considerations. One absence of Jesus away from the eyesights of his disciples, a little while after he had talked to them. As occurs in a previous prophecy in John 13 33, My children, I shall be with you a little while longer. 2. The absence period is short and no one will see him during this period. As occurs also in the previous prophecy in John 13 33, You cannot go where I am going. 3. The disciples will see Jesus after the absence period, because he would go to heaven. How long was the absence period and where? Well, if John 16 16 says, And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And John 20. 17 says that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene early Sunday morning and said to her, But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. And to my God and your God. This means that the disciples did not see Jesus from the time after the troops came to arrest him during the judicial proceedings for the person who was arrested. The crucifixion's day and on Saturday. As for the Jews, we'll see him no more, as we saw before in John 14, 18 18-19, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer in the world, the Jews will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. As for the place where Jesus was going to hide, away from the eyesights, for a short period of time, it seemed, and God knows best. It is the place that Jesus already hinted to it as the heart of earth, in the narration of Matthew 12:40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth which means the Jewish heartland, such as a cave in one of the mountains, or any other place of refuge. Jesus was not alone in that place, but God was with him. But I am not really alone, because the Father is with me. John 16 32 The narration of Matthew indicates that Jesus would stay in the heart of the earth, three days safe from all the dangers that surrounded him. Just as Jonah remained safe from all dangers that surrounded him in the belly of the great fish. Both Jonah and Jesus came out alive, because God already rescued them from death miraculously. If the matter was like this, so, the area of the heart of the earth, as Matthew mentioned in his text, by no means it signifies the tomb, where the body of the crucified person was laid. As many people believe today, for the following reasons. 1. When Jesus prophesied and said to the Jews, You will look for me, but you will not find me. Because you cannot go where I will be. 
Did the Jews look for Jesus when he was a corpse in the tomb so that we can ascertain that the heart of the earth signifies the tomb? Or they looked for him while he was still alive? In this case, the heart of the earth by no means signifies the tomb, but the saved place where Jesus was hiding. To Jesus said to the Jews about that place, but you will not find me, because you cannot go where I will be. John 7 34, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go you cannot come. John 8 21. While the tomb was at the Jews' disposal, Pilate already gave them an authority over the tomb. He said to them, You have a God, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went there and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Matthew 27 colon 65 dash 66. Jonah was alive in the belly of the great fish. While the person who was put in the tomb was dead. For if the body was put in the tomb about sunset on Friday, when the Sabbath was about to begin, Luke 23. 54, then it remained in the tomb for only one day, Saturday, which is not close enough to concur with Jonah's three days in the belly of the great fish. On the other hand, Jesus going to the hiding place in the Jewish heartland, the heart of earth, during the night of the Last Supper till Sunday. Make him approach the period of Jonah in the great fish. 5. The people knew about the tomb and that there was a body inside it. They could have gone there at any time, while no one could go to the place where Jesus was hiding. Jesus also prophesied to his disciples that God would by no means would let him down at the time when they themselves would let him down at a most critical moment. He said, Indeed the hour is coming, yes has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. John 16 32 And in Luke 11 29 30, when the Jews crowded around Jesus asking him a miracle, he got angry at them and prophesied saying, How evil are the people of this generation? They asked for a miracle, but none will be given to them except the miracle of Prophet Jonah. In the same way that the Prophet Jonah was a sign for the people of Nineveh. So that son of man will be a sign for the people of this generation. What was the thing that made Jonah a sign to the Ninevites? The answer is in the book of Jonah 1 15, 17 and 2. 1 10, where it the Bible says, So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord God from the fish's belly. So the Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land alive. This was the miracle of Jonah. He was thrown to the deadly sea, but God rescued him. Then he became by this miraculous rescue a sign to the Ninevites. So, in the same way, Jesus prophesied that he too would be rescued like Jonah by God. Then he would become by the miraculous rescue a sign for the people of his generation. But if Jesus was already crucified, as the forger claimed, then he would be a false messiah. Because he already told the Jews thus, the only sign to prove to you that I am the messiah is the sign of Jonah, as Jonah was rescued, he would also be rescued. Also, after Jesus had rebuked the scribes and Pharisees and described them as snakes and sons of snakes, sons of those who murdered the prophets, they will not escape the condemnation of hell and had told them that how often he wanted to gather the Jews together, but they were not willing. So, he prophesied to them saying, See, your house is left to you desolate, for say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, John 23, 31-39. But the counterplot of Jesus to avoid the Jews' plot till the coming of the hour to leave this world was as follow, after this, Jesus traveled in Galilee. Because the Jewish authorities there were wanting to kill him, John 7, 1. Questioning the Jews, did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? John 7 19. He used to rebuke them for seeking to kill him, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. John 8 40. From that day on the Jewish authorities made plan to kill Jesus. So Jesus did not travel openly in Judea, but left and went to a place near the desert, to a town named Ephraim, where he stayed with the disciples. John 11 colon 53-54 Then the Pharisees left and made plans to kill Jesus. When Jesus heard about the plot against him, he went away from that place. Matthew 12 colon 14-15 Finally, God foretold Jesus through his divine inspiration that he would thwart the murderous plot of the Jews and raise him up to heaven.
Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. John 13 1. 6. This falsifier knew what to do to spread his teaching among the Gentiles. He granted a space in paradise for anyone who would confess that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from death. He said, the invitation is for everyone, because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. God is the same Lord of all. This teaching is made all the more attractive because it is devoid of the burden of the law without any accountability due to sins. In essence, entry into paradise is subject to no more than acceptance of the alleged Son of God as one's personal Savior, he who washed away sins with his blood and resurrection. Rebranding of Jesus' message with such creed explains why it spread so rapidly and superficiality. But God already sent his message to the human mind in order to work over his soul, to straighten the soul on the right path. He already showed man what is wrong and what is right. Indeed he succeeds whose mind purifies his soul when he obeys and performs what God ordered, by following the true faith and doing good deeds. And indeed he fails whose mind does not purify his soul when he ignores what God has ordered, by rejecting true faith for polytheism, or doing every kind of evil wicked deed. 7. Finally, this falsifier had become convinced that Jesus would return back while he, the forger, was still alive. He prophesied that Jesus would come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Those who have died believing in Jesus will rise to life first. Then this inventor and his followers who are still alive and breathing that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. Now, two thousand years have passed since the prophecy, but nothing happened as this falsifier had prophesied, while his soul has long since descended. And at judgment day, will be called to account for deceiving the nations.